Have you guys ever wanted to create something like this? If you've ever been interested in creating huge, crazy landscapes or large scenes in general in Blender, I hope this video covering my workflow, kind of like a tutorial, will help you guys and give you guys super valuable lessons on how to manage huge scenes like this. In this video, we're not only using base Blender. This video is definitely using tools that are somewhat industry standard or at least are paid add-ons. Um, in this case, I'm using Speedtree, I'm using Gaia for some assets, and I will be using GeoScatter for most of my scatter work. Please don't be dissuaded just by the fact that I'm using some other softwares rather than base Blender. I still feel like this video has a huge value for anybody in the Blender space just to look at my workflow, perhaps take a few lessons away from it, be inspired by it. I mostly think the lessons you take away aren't necessarily tied to the software programs that I use. You can apply, of course, my workflow or your own workflow modified by this video um, to any products uh, that you use. Um, it's mostly just a video covering on how to handle huge scenes um, in Blender, but could also be Cinema 4D, for example. Before we start with this workflow tutorial, whatever, I want to give a special shout out to, um, well, my own pack. A classic mountain pack. Hey guys, uh, Joe here, friend of the show. I'm here to support my pal Martin uh, with his uh, classic mountain pack. Yo, the freshest mountain pack there is in the world wide web. So go ahead and go to the Gumroad and support my pal Martin in making uh, his uh, 3D tutorials. I already did a video on how to texture mountains uh, where I also give away a free asset. But in this video, I'll be using my own pack um, to basically create the whole landscape, mountainscape, whatever. Uh, and I also wanna give another shout out to GeoScatter because a lot of this video, of course, will be using said product. And GeoScatter is not only like the strongest scattering add-on or tool in Blender, it's also backed by amazing developers and the community on their Discord who always are open to help. They are dedicated and they're super nice to their community. So again, thank you guys for helping out with this project too. This project is inspired by Lorenzo Lanfranconi's work. I just wanna give a shit shot. He's an environment artist, but he does it in 2D painting, I think digital painting. So I just wanna give him a quick shout out too, because it'd be unfair if I didn't. This video has timestamps down below. That way you can just easily go back to certain parts or visit certain parts again, if you need some extra info on it. And um, yeah, make sure you use those uh, to keep uh, this video a bit more digestible. It's gonna be very long. Let's get started. Hey, you, you're finally awake. All right, guys, so we're gonna zoom over this part quite quickly. It's the referencing part. Referencing, of course, is extremely important if you're gonna do any bigger project because it kind of gives you like a base to fall back on in case you ever get lost in your scene and you need some inspiration. It also kind of helps you achieve the goal you set in the beginning of your project instead of you know straying away too far from what you wanted to make. However, it's something that you also have to play around with and give yourself space with because you don't wanna limit yourself only to the reference unless you're like, working for a client who's very, very strict on what he wants or she wants. Reference is great, but you should always in personal projects, give yourself freedom to explore because that way you can learn new things and you know expand your knowledge set. What I did is I started out putting Lorenzo Lanfranconi's work in my reference and then just looking at stuff that is basically, yeah, very much similar to his work, AKA Italian monasteries, the Tinicho Canton in Switzerland, and um, the Verzaccia Valley, which is kind of the area which it looks like his work is based off of. But then I expanded into looking at the Valle Canton for the mountains because I wanted to get more alpine looking mountains myself. Another big step in referencing for me is referencing the foliage. So what I do is I go to inaturalist.org. It's a website where you can find flora and fauna based on a certain location. So I actually chose the Tinicho Canton and I look at what kind of flora lives there. And then I can basically choose whatever trees, whatever plants I think would look good in my scene. What I do is I basically choose the trees and plants that one, I have models of, but two, I also really recognize. That way you can really create a sort of 
backstory to your scene. So let's say I've been to the Alps a few times and I really recognize this one flower I've seen on the slopes. Knowing that that flower grows in this area, I'm, I'm for sure going to add a model of that flower to this scene because I know it will instantly give other people who have been to the Alps that recognition so they could basically in their head already figure out where this is supposed to play out. What's also nice about iNaturalist.org is that it gives you reference images of those plants in those locations. This is very important because like, let's say a Scots pine. A Scots pine in the Baltics is not going to look the same as a Scots pine in the Valais Canton. One is in like a swampy marshland in the lower regions, you know, and the other is on a mountain slope. The environment's gonna shape that tree differently. So it's very nice to have reference that actually shows how the plant grows and develops in said environment. So yeah, for sure use iNaturalist.org to get reference on all the flora and fauna in the scenes you want to scatter it gives your scenes a level of realism and it also just really helps in like establishing where your scene truly takes place or you know what it's really based off of because i find too many times people just take a tree model that kind of looks you know like a tree and just plop it down if you want to be more i guess true to real life it's always nice to take that extra step at the end here you can see my whole reference board you can see I have the Tinicho Canton, the Versace Valley. I got Italian monasteries listed out and then I have trees and plants listed. That way I have just a great base to fall back on. So yeah, definitely before you start any 3D process, just gather some reference so you can like build, build up your inspiration, build up your idea better. And uh, yeah, great way to start. So now we're gonna start with asset creation. Asset creation is something you wanna mostly do before you actually start working on your scene but it's understandable that not every single asset is going to be fully done before you start con like composition and layout in my case i just focused on the main subjects of this shot that i knew were going to be the focus points that was the mountains and the monastery so this terrain is not for the actual final image i decided to use a classic mount the classic mountain pack which i created for the scene i actually decided to use that and of course I can't give away the secret sauce because I'm selling that pack to support my channel. So yeah, you'll have to figure out how to make those style of mounts yourself. But these mounts um, are also really good looking and I'll be giving away this hype pack or hype map, whatever uh, tour file for free. You can use it in Gaia. So yeah, let's talk about how I created this one. It's a really nice mountain range for basically any type of valley use, I suppose. I will also be giving away the uh, tour file that you can use in Gaia if you have Gaia yourself. Now let's start, yeah, from the beginning. So on the strain, I used a range node. Range is just basically a yeah, whole mountain range altogether. So a base range node is more like this. However, what I got is um, a lot more, let's say smoothed out and larger features rather than like uh, smaller features. You can see, see I turned the scale down. I um, basically turned all the sliders down except for height. Then I used a gradient uh, node to kind of slope my height with an embed node. So as you can see, using an embed node really created this sloped, yeah, um, height map where you have a really nice valley or lake area or whatever. At this point, I also, I also start working on a basically rock map to kind of like break up my terrain. I get a rock map, I displace it and I fold it. So I get a really sharp, um, yeah, stratified looking layery uh, effect from that. I also make sure I get a height mask so I can mask out, you know, sediment areas, blah, blah, blah. Now I fold my uh, terrain and you can see what that does. I recommend everybody use the fold node and the stratify node to just, you know, get some really nice looking mountains. And here you can see the effect. I normally keep my range from 30 to 45%. Of course, you can change your angle to see whatever angle fits your mountainscape. But for me, I really like this. It gave me this really nice triangular shape on a lot of the mountains. All right, so we add a valley node, which basically introduces, um, yeah, how do you say it? A little sediment, I suppose. Uh, it erodes the valley areas of your mountainscape. So you can see that kind of lowered it all. Then I add a shear node. I'm not too sure, <laughs> not too sure what shear does. Um, I think it's more folding, but like, on a smaller scale, I suppose. Here I start working on outcrops. I think this is another shaper. I'm basically shaping uh, parts of my terrain. So you can see I'm just creating a sediment under layer as it were. So I want to have a very sedimenty bottom and like a very rocky peaky, you know, that kind of effect. So this is a very sedimented 
mountainscape. This is probably what you would see a lot of people create because they don't really mask stuff out. But we have this very strong, rocky, you know, rugged terrain over here that's been just been combined with this, you know, rocky node that we created. So you can see this is very, very displaced, very detail rich. And we are going to combine that again with a height map, height mask, basically masking out rocky areas and sedimented areas and combining them. I think I went a bit strong. I would even probably lower this a little bit because I like the rocky areas a lot. There we go. That's a lot more strong and pretty looking. So as you can see, I now have masked a sedimented area with a nice rocky rough, you know, really strong area with lots of detail. I added a C node just uh, because I wanted a big lake in my scene. So, you know, having a C node kind of just flattens out a certain area uh, and does it nicely, makes sense. Added rivers because I wanted that erosion running from the mountains into the valley, into the lake. It really, yeah, does a good job of that. And it gives you masks for future texturing. And at this point I start uh, my texturing process, which on this mountain was very simple. So. Don't recommend um, doing what I did. I use an arboreal node to mask out where trees will be, which is of course really nice to use with GeoScatter. So I just make a little mask and I export that. And uh, yeah, if you have Gaia, definitely go down in the description and check out the tour file and play with it. I mean, yeah, I think it's a really fun, uh, nice little mountainscape. So yeah, absolutely go ahead. It takes forever to load. There we go. Oh, look how, that, how detail rich those peaks are. If you want, you could always add a snow node, I suppose. Like right now, this is more like a really dry, arid mountainscape, especially up here. It's a bit thick, but I really like the snowfall node to um, kind of sort of create sediment as well. It could be grass, could be snow, could be all kinds of stuff. Um, but let's lower it a little bit. Let's see what happens. Yeah, like that. This is really cool. Absolutely uh, enjoy this tour file. All right, everybody, we're gonna quickly cover the building modeling. I'm not an authority on modeling in general. I am okay at it, but that's it. I don't use any special add-ons. I'm not like an asset creator. So I don't believe that my input here is like more special on other sources. So at the end of this, I'll link you to a few videos that will explain everything better and more thoroughly. So I start out with snapping enabled uh, to create the base shape of each building. I make sure to keep an eye on the scale to make sure that the building is, you know, proportional. It isn't like hundreds of meters big. It's, you know, eight meters tall or that kind of stuff. And that doorways are, you know, around two meters tall. Just simple stuff like that. When the base shape is created, I add loop cuts and then inset stuff and then extrude, but then inwards. That way I can cre easily create the shape of windows in this square building. When that's all done, I can add loose details. This means like window bars, shutters on the windows, drain pipes and roofing. I can just add those objects loosely to the um, yeah base square basically that the building is based off of. I'm not actually going to make sure it's all in one object. I'll just use separate objects to add little details on top of this base shape. For the roofing, you can often choose to use a texture and you'll be fine. However, when you are gonna be close to a building or let's say in medium to close range shots, you'll see that it's a flat texture if you're in a wrong angle. So you're, you're better off using an actual 3D geometry roof tiling instead of a texture. To do this, just get one single tile object, use an array modifier to first array it in a big line, and then use another array modifier in the other axis to actually create a plane. Just create a huge plane of, yeah, roof tiles. Then duplicate that so you don't actually lose that uh, singular roof tile. Once it's duplicated, apply the array modifiers. This is destructive, so that's why you duplicate it. Once you've applied it, put this huge plane of tiles on top of your building's roof, and then use a Boolean modifier to cut out the shape of the roof so it actually aligns. You can then use a separate roof tile that's like on the edges of corners and the peak of the roof, as it were, to hide this cut, basically.
Once you have done all this, you've added little details onto your base shape, you can start texturing. I texture with PBR materials and then mix the base wall material with a damaged or weathered material. In my case, this is a brick material. I mask between the two with custom painted masks. I chose to use a custom painted mask because then I can locate certain areas where I believe it would be more weathered and damaged, such as near the drain pipes or under the window sills, or let's say on the corner of the buildings. I want it to be a bit more bricky rather than plaster wall. And that way I can just, yeah, paint that in myself rather than, you know, having to play around with a noise, with a noise texture and having to find the right seed. Again, here's two resources that explain everything better than I do and the ones that I learned from the most. So now onto the trees. I started out by creating leaf meshes or in this case needle meshes inside of Blender. For the sake of staying somewhat low poly, I just used two atlases from Quixel and basically crossed them by rotating one of them 90 degrees and aligning the yeah, center twig area. I then baked out the textures using Simply Bake and went to Speed Tree. Inside of Speed Tree, I started out with a Quixel photo scan of a spruce trunk and its roots. You can import this as a mesh inside of speed tree. On the mesh, we use a stitch node that will find an appropriate point in the mesh to connect a speed tree branch to. It will also bake a mask transitioning from the mesh texture to the tileable bark texture that you're using. Make sure you have a similar bark texture to the texture on the mesh because otherwise the seam will be extremely noticeable. You definitely need to have the same color and same pattern in this bark. I start out with the underlying dead branches and twigs. Dead parts of the tree add a lot of fidelity to your model, so I definitely recommend adding them. You can see I'm just layering on the detail on these dead branches, as they have no needles on them, so you'll have to make them look quite good since they aren't hidden. You can see I only have these dead twigs near the bottom of the tree. This is to save polygons, keep detail on the lower areas of the tree, and realistically, of course, the lower parts of the tree are older and have more shade, so you have more dead branches. Now I add the big branches. Now you can see I shape them based on the height location on the trunk. The lower, the larger, and also have more gravity so they're getting pulled down more. Uh, while the newer branches on top are more grown towards the sky still because they're shorter and yeah, younger. So I add twigs coming out at sideways angles from these main branches. And from these twigs, I will add my needles. So you can see I add my needles in the form of fronds, not leaves. As my needle mesh is basically a small twig with needles already attached to it in this like atlas. So yeah, a frond mesh is more suitable than a leaf mesh in this case. So anybody who knows speed tree knows when you add fronds, you normally add a invisible twig mesh and then you add the frond node on top of that. And this frond node is the one that you give your needle mesh and needle texture. So you can see in this first layer of fronds or needles, the tree is still very empty. So I add another layer. So another layer of twigs that I shape, and these ones are longer and flow downwards more due to the weight. And from these, I will connect another layer that sprouts out of it. I do this because needles often have a sort of trident shape. So you have one main needle, and then around the middle of the needle, uh, two other needles come out sideways. So you kind of get like a trident shape coming out which is what I'm kind of doing with this extra layer of needles. At the end here, you see me adding yet more dead branches on the bottom of the tree. Same process as the upper ones. All right, so let's start building this scene. I will start laying out the basic shapes of the foreground, then the midground, and then the background. For the foreground, I create a plane, place it at an appropriate place in the scene, and start shaping it as a slope with a road carved into it. I 
After I create the basic shape, I add a multi-resolution modifier and begin sculpting in some basic detail. At this point, I add in a mannequin from Mixamo to give me some reference for scale. This really helps me laying out my scene before I've added any objects. This also helps you avoid an awkward moment when you realize everything is like way too big or way too small. After that, I start sculpting the mid-ground. I just imagine it being a slight cliff face with the monastery on top of it. So I kind of add a square and just start sculpting a cliff face and a slope into that. After sculpting, I start placing my monastery and move things around until I'm happy with the general layout. After those initial steps, I start importing my mountains from the classic mountain pack. Again, the lovely thing about this pack is the speed. You can get the mountains that are textured nicely placed in your scene in a few minutes. For this scene, I use a very simple HDRI daytime lighting setup. I use easy HDRI to increase the sun strength by multiple hundreds, 
as H2Is often lack a very strong contrasty sun. You could also add a sun object, but for this scene, I just found that increasing the sun strength worked just fine. And also, it also helps optimize your scene because you're using less light objects. At this point, I add in a lake, just using a plane with a really simple water texture on it. And after that, I add an atmospheric haze. For the atmospheric haze, these are the settings I use. I find that using a higher anisotropy and a tiny bit of blue emission gives you the most realistic atmospheric haze results. This won't really look like fog or mist, but yeah, it looks more like the blue tint that you see in the distance. Also using this setup, I find is the most optimized uh, for animations. Of course, you can make a way more realistic volumetric setup, but you have to think of your render times as well. I now add the texture for the road. It's a very simple tileable texture from Quixel. I just applied it and then UV mapped it correctly onto the plane. I will hide the seam between the two textures with scattered grass, so I'm not too worried about it. After that, I will add my first row object. It's a stone wall from Quixel. I will just think that into the slope on the right hand side of the road. I'm kind of making it look like an old wall that's slowly being eroded over time. Before I call it quits on this chapter, I make sure to texture the cliff acid that the monastery is placed on, and then I sculpt one more cliff acid that will be placed behind the monastery. I also import one more classic mountain pack asset. This time I'll just use a valley so I can have some ground near the lake that isn't just going straight from the mountain into the water and have some you know, flat ground where I can play some more forests. I can always change things later, but it's good enough to start scattering and kind of getting a look for what the actual scene will uh, start looking like in the end. Um, so yeah, everything is very flexible while you're working. So time to jump into the scattering, I suppose. Alright, so for the scattering, I use Geoscatter. Geoscatter gives you insane levels of control to create intricate scenes with thousands, if not millions of instances. You have endless control to create custom biomes and a lot more. If you are watching this or you have watched this and you really want to pick up Geoscatter, then make sure to use my referral link down below. The folks who developed this add-on saw my work and were kind enough to offer me a referral link to support my channel and future content surrounding scattering. So if you want to pick up an awesome add-on and support my channel, then definitely use the link below. In the future, I will also do other videos purely focusing on Geoscatter, where I go through all the techniques and settings that you can use and what is like optimized and what can maybe slow down your scenes. So yeah, I will go into this add-on a lot more in the future. To start off, I use Geoscatter, select the plane that I want to scatter on, and then select the trees I want to scatter. Then I use the manual scatter option to quickly draw in instance trees. Now you can see that the trees are way too large and that's because I didn't apply the scale on the selected plane. You should always apply the scale and rotation on objects that you're scattering on top of because otherwise you know, you could have some problems such as massive trees or rotation that's not aligning correctly. After I apply the scale, I see that my trees are rotated due to the slope. So I quickly head into Geoscatter's rotation settings and apply align normal and then lower the tilt angle on the random rotation. After this, I quickly head into the viewport to check out how dense the trees are and to see how many more I need to scatter. I go back into manual mode and start drawing in way more trees.
Now you can scatter with scatter layers and then tweak density and locations with masks and numbers, but I'm a huge fan of the manual scatter mode because it gives me all the control I need for these smaller areas and I feel like a 3D Bob Ross. Manual scatter also feels lighter on the scene. I don't know if this is an actual thing. I will have to do some tests in the future. In GeoScatter, you're also able to add multiple objects into a collection and then have a single scatter layer be scattered on multiple objects. This makes it a lot faster and I don't constantly have to select different objects and then make new scatter layers for them. I can just have one scatter layer that is used on multiple objects. I now add in some different trees from Botanic and Forest Pack, but I soon find out that my own tree models are more optimized and are just better for the scene. In this chapter, we'll be doing a few more things next to scattering. I basically just tweak and adjust things constantly through my process. I think most artists don't really have a very linear workflow. We constantly go back and tweak things until we're happy with it. Here you can see me add in a staircase that climbs up the monastery. I also tweak some textures such as the cliff and the road. I make the road a little bit more brighter because it was very dark and muddy and I kind of wanted a bright, dry, sandy look. And for the cliffs, uh, I thought they were very gray and desaturated and I wanted a little bit more of an earthy tone in there. Now I added my own spruce tree model and I texture it inside of Blender because the material setup speed tree provides is just really not good. It's, it looks really bad. I use a noise texture in the bump to hide the seam between the root and the trunk because these two textures are of course stitched together with a little bit of a mask, but in the bump and normal, you can still see that stitch. So if you then just add a noise texture over the whole model uh, in this bump, then it really hides the seam a lot better. I add the spruce model to the conifer scatter layer and using GeoScatter, I can even tweak the probability of which model is instanced. So in my case, I give the spruce a higher probability than the setter, 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 eastern setter. So in my case, I give the spruce a higher probability than the eastern setter, resulting in the spruce tree showing up more than the eastern setter in the scatter layer. You can also just use a random selection or whatever. There's a lot of options here. I now move some of the mountains in the background and scale them up a bit because I wanted the larger, more imposing look in the background. At this point, I also start to work a bit more on the lake. I add some variation to the bump in the water. With a mask, I mask out certain areas that are very rough and other areas that are more smooth looking. You see this in real lakes too, where the wind sweeps up certain places, causing variations in the roughness or variations in the amount of waves. I now paint in more conifer trees on the steeper cliff areas. At this point, I load my Cliff Scott's pine model and place it on the edge above the monastery. I change this model to an updated one later in the process. That's why it looks different right now. After that, I create a third layer for trees with more pines that sit on top of the cliff. I just play around with what trees will grow here. Uh, and eventually I settle on spruces and Scots pines living in this higher area. Now I start appending all the objects for the more detailed scatter layers. And then Blender crashes. I start out with my first normal scatter layer. These will be the shrubs that cover the midground. I use GeoScatter's abiotic settings, such as elevation and slope, to mask out where these shrubs will grow. Then I use a noise pattern to mask out certain sections of these shrubs. And lastly, I use Bezier curves to make accurate masks of certain areas where I want to mask out certain foliage layers. So you can see me creating a mask around the monastery and near the conifer forest because I want to avoid foliage clipping into the monastery model. 
And I also think that conifer forest floors are a lot more dry, so I don't want a lot of foliage growing there. Then I add another scatter layer with ferns that will then fill up these empty areas where I remove the large foliage with these masks. At this point, I select all my rock and twig models and create another manual scatter layer. And using a very, very high density, I paint in like rock slides on the slopes of the cliffs behind the monastery. For the foreground, I will use even more manual scatter layers. I start by manually painting in the grass on the road and on the sides of the road. I then randomly get sidetracked and spend a long time tweaking the weathered wall material on my monastery because for some reason it was bothering me. After that, I just quickly set up a grass field using a regular scattering method and I play around with the grass shader. Again, I go more in depth on like large grass fields or large grass uh, scenes, I guess, on my Patreon page. So yeah, that's where I go more in depth on that kind of stuff. Now, I have to apologize as I missed recording the layer of foreground trees, but this was just easily done by selecting the broadleaf tree species I had loaded in and just manually scattering them around uh, the edges of the foreground plane. I tweak some of the grass layers and then proceed by loading in a biome from the moss biome pack onto the stone wall. This instantly gives me a preset with several layers that I can then tweak. I then make all these scatter layers scatter on all the wall models that I group together into a collection. To add a fence, I took a Quixel model and then used Geoscatter's chain brush inside of the manual scatter mode to easily draw on a fence that connects correctly. Just change the rotation of the imported model until everything lines up correctly and then you can draw any shape you want. I then create a bezier mask to mask out the moss from my wall in sunny areas. I don't think moss would grow in very bright, dry sun, so yeah, that's why I did that. Now I start manually placing my own spruce trees near the camera. I want the shot to kind of exit a forest and then move into a mountain meadow. Now it's time to start detailing. I just select different species and then manually scatter them all over the foreground, pretty much repeating the same process for each species.
Also, pro tip, scattering tiny twigs and rocks is a better alternative to say VRAM if you want to add detail to the ground plane, but you don't want to use an adaptive subdivision and micro displacement. After all that, I start scattering foliage on the monastery to blend it in with the environment. Nearing completion, I actually changed the Scott's Pine models and I also changed the Beech Tree models uh, to updated ones that I created. Now that the fore and mid ground are almost done, I start working on the background. First, I make a weight map of all the visible areas. These mountains are multiple kilometers in size, so avoiding scattering hundreds of thousands of trees on areas that aren't even visible will help with the performance inside of Blender. It doesn't necessarily help with the rendering performance, but your viewport will thank you. At first, I mask out the trees on the mountain with the tree map from Gaia, but eventually I choose to mask them out with the cavity map instead. The tree map from Gaia is really nice, but I just wanted a bit more of a dense uh, foresty area on the uh, convexes, so yeah. And then masking by height, I scatter broadleaf trees on the lower areas of the mountain and keep the conifer trees at higher altitudes. I then scatter large rock falls, again using the cavity map, but instead of on the convex where the trees are, I use the concave, which is the dip. At last, I change the lake once again to a volumetric setup instead of a plane. It just looks a tiny bit better, but it isn't a huge difference. For the clouds, I just use an open VDB from a pack that I bought on ArtStation. I tried out Sam Krug's cloud shader, which looks really amazing, but sadly takes a really long time to render, especially on my 3060. So I just had to switch to a regular principled volume setup uh, with a really low density. In the end, I add in a sky background plane as you do. and then add some small animations and all my scatter layers that are very subtle, but just add a tiny bit of dynamic movement. I also animate the clouds a tiny bit moving through the scene, but yeah, it's all very, very subtle. And uh, yeah, don't, don't overdo it. Now um, we have to optimize the scene a little bit and we're ready to render. All right, guys, unfiltered Martin here, just finished editing most of this. And um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a journey. I was actually doing all of the work um, on the side of my actual thesis. So it took a very long time to get this video out there. It was also a lot of work. Um, so like you might not know, but recording Blender is fun and all, but you easily record six hours, you know, in a row um, and you don't really realize what you're doing or you're not noting it down. So I have to rewatch or, you know, skim through six hours of footage to see the few things that I actually did that I did not then revert because again, it's not a linear process. A lot of this is doing something and then control Z, you know, and doing something control Z. Um, I think control Z is probably the most used key for any artist uh, that's working digitally. So yeah, it's, um, it was quite rough going through all the footage and having then to like write a script and narrate and then, you know, cut the right things at the right time. Yeah, it was, it was a lot, but it was very fun, very educational for me. The more I watch it, the more I realize I do not like this scene and I need to be better. <laughs> and it might sound crazy, but yeah, no, I really have uh, a lot of things that I'm like, okay, I could have done that better. I could have done this better. Um, you know, you learn while you do it. And I hope you guys are learning with me and making your own projects as well. Or you're just along for the ride, enjoying the music and uh, I don't know, putting this on your second monitor as you play games. Um, but yeah, no, it's been, uh, been quite a, it's been quite a journey. I've just handed in my uh, thesis as well. So that should also conclude my life as a student, um, unless I fail, <laughs> also a possibility. Uh, but yeah, so um, thank you guys for watching the video. Thank you guys for taking the time and actually getting to the end. I hope it was very uh, educational or insightful. 
Um, and I also really hope uh, I'll see you in the next videos because of course now I have more time. And uh, yeah, I really enjoy making this kind of content for you guys. Uh, I will have to work on the side of course, but yeah, it's gonna be less busy than of course the final month of the thesis. So hope to see you guys soon again. Just quickly wanna plug my patrons for being super, super relaxed and uh, hope to get more activity on the Patreon page again. Uh, as I did in the beginning because I just spammed a bunch of videos and assets right in the beginning and then I had no content to stretch over stretch out over time um, but yeah definitely want to do some um, patron only content that is then like decided by poll and that kind of stuff uh, but yeah I'm, I'm also gonna enjoy a night of good sleep after the thesis and everything and yeah thank you guys for watching bye bye